It's with my delight to introduce to you today our speaker, David Mann. Uh, he is VP of Technology Broadband, Broadband Networks at Nor Nortel. Uh, in speaking uh, with David uh, over the lunch hour, he uh, certainly has a, had an interesting career. Uh, he has worked and lived in many countries, including the UK, Spain, Zambia, Belgium, Sweden, and now Canada. We're fortunate to have him in Canada. Uh, in 1989, David received on behalf of STC the Queen's Award for Technical Innovation. As I've indicated, David's current position in Nortel is Vice President of Technology Broadband Networks, where he's leading his organization and the development of next generation network fabrics. He's also a member of Nortel's Technology Council. Uh, David's had many positions, I guess, uh, in Nortel, including Vice President and General Manager of Broadband Switching, and he's also served as Nortel's Chief Engineer. Uh, David's going to speak today on a speed, agility, and innovation, the promise of WebTone. So with that short introduction, oh. uh, I introduce to you, oh, thank you very David much. Mann. So um, before I start, I'm, oh, sorry. So before, I, I, I'm not going to use charts. Uh, I'm, I'm going to declare this a chart-free zone, uh, and I'm going to explain why in a little story just before I start. And uh, just uh, before uh, Nortel purchased the company that I worked in in the UK, um, I was invited to visit BNR in Ottawa in Canada. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's this huge, huge building. And uh, passing through one of the corridors there, I had these two young chaps who just joined from university discussing uh, BNR and working there. And one was saying to the other that um, uh, in here there are definitely two types of people. And there are uh, people who are casually dressed and people like myself who wear jackets and ties and so on and so forth. Do you have any understanding why this should be? And so both of them are fair neophytes to, to BNR, but one was obviously more expert than the other and said, well, I've got it kind of figured out. He said, uh, we make hundreds of charts with these Apple Macintoshes, and then we take them to meetings and we present them. And the people who present are the people who are casually dressed. So I figured out they're the workers. Right? And the other people with the suits and stuff on, they're some kind of peculiar religious sect. <laughs> right? And he said, well, how do you make that out? He said, well, they sit at the end of the table going, oh my God, oh my God. Right. Anyway, so, so today we're going to have a chart-free um, day. Um, I'm going to try and cover, um, I was asked to keep it fairly high level, but I can go to whatever level you want me to go to until I can't answer the questions. All right? So just keep digging. Um, I'll try and keep it uh, like half of the time for me speaking, and then half the time is for you to ask whatever questions you wish to ask. Right, except anything about the stock market yesterday. All right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, the title of the, the talk is Speed, Agility, and Innovation Fulfilling the Promise of Webtone. Now, uh, Webtone is something that uh, was created, a, a kind of word that we created for um, describing particular use of an IP network. Um, and so, before I get into the talk, it, it's really about secure, reliable communications. It's about um, letting the user do what the user wants to do and not have the network be a liability in the performance of that activity. And, and it's also about um, being available anywhere and on all the time. So it's like your telephone network is today, but it's available for everything you want to do. So that's really a definition of Webtone. So before I get into the talk, I'll just put that on the table in front of you. So having said all those things, not any of those are trivial, okay? knowing what IP networks do today. So I'll start off with a mandatory thank you and uh, good afternoon to all of you. And I've had a great lunch here today and I'd like to thank uh, Shirley and all the people who, who sat with me. It was great fun. We've shared some real good stories and uh, I feel much more settled than when I arrived. Uh, although it was pretty settled then as well. It's a beautiful morning driving today. So um, since I think University of Waterloo we were found 1957 and since then I think we've worked, Nortel, BNR, we've worked together uh, to pioneer cooperative education in Canada. And today we rely heavily on the consistent high quality of Waterloo students and the training they receive, uh, particularly in computer science and engineering. So that's the, that's the praise bit, right? Uh, but during the last five years, Waterloo has consistently been 
one of our top five universities, uh, both for recruiting graduates and providing the largest source of co-op students into our Nortel labs. So given the long-standing relationship, I'm really pleased that you've allowed me to come here and to accept this invitation to deliver to you this, uh, it says a lecture, it sounds wrong, I'm not going to preach or anything like that, just to talk. However, I'm also mindful of my responsibilities this afternoon. It's been said that a speech is like a wheel, and the longer the spoke, the thicker the tire. Okay? And so, with that dictum in mind, I don't plan to speak for the entire session. Instead, I'd like to leave time for your questions and comments on this increasingly networked IP world that we're facing for tomorrow. But before I get to what lies ahead, let me begin with a story that highlights where we find ourselves today. It seems that a doctor, an engineer, and a politician were arguing about which was the oldest of these professions. The doctor was the first to claim the honor and said, well, since Eve was made from Adam's rib and Adam was put into a deep sleep so that this could be done, surgery had to be involved. So the medical profession has to be the oldest. The engineer disagreed. He said, well, before Adam, the Bible tells us the order was created out of chaos and engineers are the people who do that. So engineering must be, engineering must have come first. And finally, the politician, with a wry smile on his face, turned to both of them saying, well, who do you think created the chaos in the first place? Anyways, so, <laughs> well, whatever the source, we're in the midst of a very chaotic time, and, and I think that brings me on to my subject for today. Specifically, I want to focus on three main issues. First, how the internet is changing virtually everything that we do, and very quickly too. Secondly, some of the key effects of these changes, and finally, what this means for both the designers and users of the network of tomorrow. And I sum it up in one acronym, and that is VUCA. This is a word we use in Nortel, VUCA. We shouted at people who run for cover. It stands for Velocity, Uncertainty, Complexity, and Ambiguity. It is actually a military term, uh, but we use it in, in our company because that's what we're facing. So if you ask anyone to predict the future, you really should look in a glass ball because you'll be just about as accurate. It is really difficult to, to figure out how this is all unfolding. But these are all major forces at work in our industry. And it means that to prosper in this business today, you do really need the wisdom of Solomon and the patience of Job. So remember that word, VUCA. I'll come back to it occasionally. It represents both enormous challenges, but also vast potential and vast opportunities. So let me begin, begin with the context of the computing and communications industry and how it's changing fundamentally and quickly. For a long time, we've talked about the convergence of the computer and communications industries. Well, we've got convergence, but it wasn't really what we expected. Convergence has actually occurred at internet. The internet has produced that convergence. It is the major force in the current and widespread restructuring of both the computing and the communications industry. This fundamental change is occurring in ever decreasing time cycles, which we often refer to as web time. And a web year is about a fourth of a normal year, right? And sometimes it's even less. It depends on which boss you're speaking to. And this is spawning a host of new types of companies and service providers. The communications industry is a true hysteric, historic, or maybe it is hysteric, too, historic turning point as the world moves from the era of dial tone to the era of communications of all forms from the desktop. The changeover is not simply an incremental step, it's a quantum leap. And at Nortel, we're committed to an objective which we call Webtone, and I've just given you a brief description of that. It represents a paradigm shift from ear to ear connectivity to a more multi-sensory, multimodal type of communication. It's inevitable. It turns a computer into a window in the world. Webtone is about multimedia, multi-points of connectivity, about being able to not only communicate, but also to access, manage, and alter information in ways that we've never ever done before. These changes are transforming the way businesses operate. Governments define and respond to public interest and how individuals gather knowledge and information, access social services, and even entertain themselves. 
What's more, these changes will virtually reset the clock on computers and communications for future generations. Ultimately, the power of the network to deliver new markets, new productivity gains and new capabilities to businesses or to satisfying individual needs and curiosity rests on meeting certain fundamental parameters and we define them as the following. Number one, bandwidth based on application needs has to be dynamic and it has to be relatively inexpensive. Secondly, connectivity must be easy and it has to be available, always. Networks have to be as reliable and as easy to use as our current telephony network. The integrity, security and safety of mission critical transactions has to be guaranteed. You don't want your competitors getting your information. And the network must reach to anywhere, anytime, at any mode. Real value for usage will have to be obvious. It's going to be very competitive, in other words. And finally, customization and personalization will have to be an essential part of the package that a service provider offers to you. It all means nothing less than the convergence of the reach, the reliability, the ease of use, and the value of today's communication networks with the personalization, the power, sensory richness, capacity and functionality that computing gives you today. We in the communications industry are learning to adapt quickly to this environment of rapid and organic growth, even although, as I've already said, we cannot completely predict the outcome. However, we can make several observations about the characteristics of change. In 1996, for the first time in history, the network bandwidth due to data traffic on carrier backbone networks exceeded that of voice traffic. This historic event signaled the fundamental transformation from networks dominated by voice to networks dominated by data. Today, bandwidth due to data traffic is growing 10 times faster than that due to voice. More than 30% per year for data related to 3% per year for voice. At this rate, data will constitute nearly 80% of all backbone utilization by the year 2000. And we're talking about terabytes of data per week being carried out even on networks at this time. That's also the date, year 2000, when the number of internet users worldwide is expected to reach in the order of 250 million. And that seems a conservative prediction especially given the amount of email I receive every day. Now, major service providers are reporting a 15% or more increase in subscribers every month. By some time within the next decade, the concept of voice networks with data overlays will be inverted. Data networks that carry voice as one among many applications will be the norm, as limitless amounts of data and multimedia information flow unrestrained by network limitations, and that's an important aspect of looking forward, unrestrained by network limitations around the world. Today, network capacity has been tested by people who want to be able to make instant connections by voice, data, and video, whenever and wherever they want. They're less accepting of different levels of service at the office and at home. Yeah. And that's not surprising, really. Bandwidth, I often think, is a bit like chocolate. Right? Once you get a taste for it, it's really hard to do without it. Right? And for many people, there's no such thing as too much. Right? No such thing as too much bandwidth. Fortunately, at the same time, our ability to manage and transmit vast volumes of information have been growing exponentially. And I'd like to give you a few examples of what we've been doing in, in Nortel. For example, in the UK, we're building a network for cable and wireless that will increase the capacity of fibre optic links by a factor of 24. And that compared with other fiber optic utilization for other carriers in Europe um, is, is a substantial growth, right? And uh, in fact, if you look at the capacity they're creating, all voice traffic in Britain could be carried on a single fiber. Now, WorldCom is using Nortel networks to become the first carrier to offer services from voice to data to internet on a single network. So instead of having parallel networks, they're using the same network. And we're building a national fiber network for Quest communication in the US that can transport data at 160 billion bits per second at the moment. That means a single fiber could carry more than a million simultaneous telephone calls. 
or two million simultaneous internet, it says here connections, I hesitate to use the word connections in the context of internet, but at least flows, and, I, and, and you will, we can talk about that later in, in the question time, the distinction between um, connections and flows, because you know, you may have a small number of connections, but you may have many, many more flows going on in a network. Now, by the end of this year, we will have doubled that capacity to 320 billion bits per second. So we will be shipping to customers uh, network capacity on single entities of 320 gigabits. Okay. Now, within the next few years, as more people get onto the net and access high bandwidth interactive multimedia, fiber capacities will be pushed into the terabit range of trillions of bits per second. And we currently have experiments in the labs today doing that. It can be done in a variety of ways, multiple wavelengths, new waveform shapes like solitons, like spectral uh, multiplication techniques and so on. The fact is, the technology is not a limitation here. It's something that can be done. Some of them involve certain types of fiber. I mean, if you use solitons, uh, the shape of the fiber has to continually change or else the soliton doesn't work properly. But effectively, there's nothing technologically stops this from occurring shifting this huge volume of information around. And we're already working on technologies in our more advanced research labs to work at petabit speeds. And I can't, I can't figure out what goes beyond a trillion, right? But it's petabit, they call it. And, and I think it's zotabits or something like that comes after that. We're going to invent the words as we go along. Or at least 1,000 trillion bits per second is the best way I can describe it. Now this dynamic, even chaotic VUCA environment is driving major changes in the business world. It's restructuring it more and more around the internet. Uh, for example, there's WorldCom's purchase of MCI, AT&T's proposed merger with the cable giant TCI, and of course our recent merger with Bay Networks. The internet and the web are driving major changes in the marketplace. The embryonic e-commerce market of today will easily grow by a factor of 10 by the year 2000. This will be dwarfed by business to business transactions which could well multiply more than a thousand times as networks become more reliable and secure. So one of the key issues that you need to think about in your course as you go forward this year is things like reliability and security and what people are prepared to commit on a network which at the moment is pretty insecure uh, called the internet. A banking transaction over the web can be done for one tenth of the cost of doing it over an automated banking machine, which is one hundredth of the cost of doing it using a teller. And so it's little wonder that more than half of the North American banks will offer some form of online banking by the year 2000. The travel industry is the most dramatic example of growing online services. The internet can virtually take travelers to their destination to check out hotels, although I've seen pictures that didn't actually materialize when I got there, but nevertheless, uh, the internet can take you to check out the hotel, you can see the sites, you can look at events that are coming up, you can book the most cost-effective packages, and you can book airline tickets. Okay. About 90% of the $267 million that internet users spent with online travel agents in 1996 went to airline tickets. Last year, that figure had tripled to $827 million. The cost of processing each ticket bought online was just about a dollar. That's quite a drop from $8 that it would cost to book through a travel agent using computer reservation systems. The digital delivery of goods and services is becoming a major driver on the so-called network global economy. With financial services, insurance, travel, software, books, entertainment, and sports leading the way. The consumer side of the e-commerce market will grow towards $30 billion by the year 2002. But about 80% of the business conducted on the net today is transaction between companies, not sales to customers. Almost all large corporations, and something in the order of 97% in North America, are connected to the internet. And e-commerce is expected to be adopted by 50% of the businesses worldwide within the next two years or so. As the number of people connected to the web skyrockets, the impact on commerce will be tremendous. The US Commerce Department estimates business to business internet uh, commerce will rise from about $8 billion 
1997 to 17 billion this year to more than 300 billion by the year 2002. Others suggest there'll be 450 billion worth of trading going on between companies, their corporate customers, and their suppliers by then. And this is an important change for companies like myself, is that the supply chain and your customer and yourself are all linked together in a network. And it does fundamental changes to how you perform research and development, for example, and production of products. So that is another, I mean, there are all sorts of threads of change going on here. The simple fact is that today the economies of the world are not only dependent on networks, they're increasingly being driven by them. We're also seeing fundamental process changes in the industry, particularly in project development. The market dominant companies are investing huge sums in areas that they hope will preserve their leadership positions. Such large scale initiatives enable an ever increasing array of much smaller projects aimed at creating specialized applications to meet specific user needs. This relationship is producing a wealth of new technology options, but potential is not the same as success. Herb Cromer, who was the inventor of the CD laser, once said that the principal applications of any sufficiently new and innovative technology always have been and will continue to be the applications that can be created by that technology. The moral is quite clear. Don't judge a new technology solely on the basis of how it fits into existing applications. For example, when Alexander Graham Bell, a Scotsman, invented the telephone in 1875, skeptics dismissed the new device as a novelty that would never threaten the prevailing communications technology of the day. That was the telegraph. At that time, the dominance of the mighty Western Union Company, which in the preceding decades had strung a telegraph network of poles and wires alongside the railroad tracks that crisscrossed the United States, seemed unassailable. Alexander Graham Bell's telephone not only replaced the telegraph, but it also spawned a colossal global telecommunications industry. And we find ourselves today at a similar crossroads. One of the unique things about the internet is that within the same framework, and this is another important factor, you have the means of production, consumption, and distribution. And that's quite unique. Consumption, pro production, and distribution. And that's quite a different model from any previous business enabling technologies. Companies form on the net and then they dissolve. Okay? So many small companies are trying new things on the internet that this richness of experimentation is accelerating internet progress and growth. So these things that they try out test the limits and boundaries of the internet and then the internet evolves to try and accommodate the things that they've been testing. And therefore the organic growth of the internet is increasingly being determined by these new types of customers. Their experimentation with various uses and their selection of what they find valuable is playing a major role of course in the industry's evolution. And this reminds me of Nicholas Negroponte's comment, um, that's at least one of them, right? Being digital will change the nature of mass media from a process of pushing bits at people to one of allowing people or their computers to pull at those bits. Okay? It's a distinction of pushing stuff at you and see if you'll take it to you going in and helping yourself. And that brings me to the second issue I want to consider this afternoon. <coughs> And that is the broad range of pervasive changes being created by this new network-centric world that we're in. Now let me give you a few examples of what a powerful effect these networks are having on business today. First one is Dell Computing. Dell Computer does about a million dollars a day in business over the internet. And Hewlett Packard's on a similar kind of drive. Now Dell is a very interesting company because they have their cash in before they pay their suppliers. And when you look at companies, one of the things you'll measure, um, I'm sure you'll all go up into executive positions, you look at how many days are there between us buying parts and us being paid for the products that contain those parts, right? And those are called inventory days or whatever you like to call them, but it's how long you hold on to the pieces. And most of us have a positive number of days. Well, Dell has a negative number of days. And when you read that, you think, I can't, well, it's something you made a mistake here, right? But to see a negative number of days. Now, Walmart's another company that does that. You, 
go through Walmart, when Walmart, when you put the stuff through the till at Walmart, is the only time Walmart take ownership for it, for that instant in time, right? For that instant in time. And why? Because they're fully networked with all their customers. So for that tiny instant in time, they don't hold huge inventories. The minute you pay, the money's in their bank and the money's on the way to the supplier. So for that tiny instant in time that it goes through the cash register, ownership by Walmart takes place and then leaves the lost again. Yeah? As you walk out the shop, doing them a big favor. Amazon Books did $16 million worth of business on the internet last year, selling to over 180,000 customers. And FedEx's website attracts over 107,000 hits a day. Sorry, yeah, a day. And without network capabilities, it would be fair to say that it would be no FedEx as we know it today. No FedEx as we know it today. Nor would some of the world's most important industries be as competitive as they are. Boeing aircraft, for example, cut years and millions and millions and millions of dollars off the creation of the new Boeing 777. And there's a real interesting video series which is called Working Together, which shows some of that. And one part of that is about the network that was behind the people to share information, right? And the new Boeing 777 uh, saved all this money, got to market quicker, and could fly further offshore than any two engine aircraft could do in the past because they were able to get in the hours of flying required for safety purposes to have that permit done. And that was all done by having the right kind of networked infrastructure across the globe. The Ford Motor Company's intranet connects over 80,000 professionals worldwide. It has redefined the company's culture and the way it does business. I'm not going to comment on the cars, of course, but um, it is a big change in force culture in terms of the economics of how they do their business. The communications revolution tilts the balance of power from institutions to individuals. Uh, again, that's an important thing that's occurring. In the world of the internet, choice is becoming the key value. So choice between one service provider and another, choice between what you want to buy and something else is, is a key thing. And the options are increasingly, literally, at the speed of light. On any given night, as many people are plugged into America Online, the world's largest commercial online service, as there are viewers of CNN and MTV combined. Okay. Between 30 and 40% of children in the US have reduced their TV time to surf the internet. And in the US, where the average household viewing time for TV remains some 50 hours per week, it is reported that households wired to the net watch only about two thirds of this. And I guess someone's hidden the remote control as well. Okay. Um, and there are clear indications that usage is rapidly gaining interest and acceptance in North America and the English-speaking world. Websites posted in other than English, and in particular Japanese and German, have risen from 2% to 18% of the total population in the last two years. There's absolutely no doubt that people are getting hooked onto this internet. And this, in combination with rapid technology advances in the network, is creating a new breed of customers with new expectations. So here's the book you should go out and get yourself. It's called Real Time, Preparing for the Age of the Never Satisfied Customer. The Never Satisfied Customer. And it was written by Regis McKenna. And let me give you some highlights of his ideas. I think they provide uh, a pretty good context for what we've been discussing. McKenna says that, Refined and high-powered computer databases increasingly allow marketeers to tailor goods, services, and promotions precisely to customers' individual preferences and requirements. You know, when you log on to systems, you put in things that you like, what kind of preferences you've got. Well, that information has actually been used to sell stuff back to you that feed to your preferences. Right? So he says, what's the result? Customers have gone from being surprised and delighted by the marketeers' attempts to discover what will be most pleasing to them, demanding in fact, that they do nothing less. Right here, right now, tailored for me. Served up the way I like it. If the new consumer's expectations were spelled out on a billboard, this is how they would read. Consumer criteria for absolute satisfaction from supplier organizations have become so stringent as to seem unreal by any standard of the past. Yeah. The new interactive technologies collapse the space between the consumer and the innovator. The extraordinary attentiveness to customers' desires by companies using these tools leads their customers to expect a similar response from other companies. 
right? And I think you, you've seen competitors to Dell, somewhere arriving, you can construct your own computer online, right? And, and that's going to happen and happen, right? This increasingly demanding expectations of the technology literate consumer will speed up as electronic uh, infrastructure spreads wider, allowing intensifying interactivity between producers and customers. This is a global profusion of, uh, of linked media. And goodness knows what's going to happen to what we, we look at as high street malls and all that kind of stuff. I mean, as I say, I, I'm not here to predict the future, but you can easily imagine changes occurring in these. Collectively, these media represent what I consider to be a critical watershed. For business and branches of government serving the public, the important media of the past were channels for broadcast. The vital new media, by contrast, are channels of access and interaction. You can debate things. Access media holds the key to satisfying the consumer's runaway demands for real-time results. This is because access media helps organizations serve customers better by making it possible for customers to serve themselves. Okay. So you are enabled to help yourself serve yourself for what you want. Without any sense of effort, customers are satisfied by means of sophisticated, hidden or transparent technology, some of the software and applications, right, about who's working, they need to know nothing. The customer doesn't need to know what these things do. They're only interested in how it helps them do what they want to do. People aren't concerned with the technology. They care about what it will do for them. If the value is apparent, the demand quickly follows. Nortel's one meg modem, for example, which we announced last year, has already generated more than a billion dollars worth of orders, just simply because it can push information to the residents, schools, government, at a faster speed than any available modem. We're also working with Microsoft to join the market various consumer applications that employ the modem and Microsoft products. The result is significantly enhancing end user choice and network capabilities. And earlier this year, we announced a planned alliance with network computing devices uh, to allow university students, staff, and faculty to access the internet at speeds at least 17 times greater than today's fastest available modems. Installed in dormitories, classrooms, and libraries, the system provides both on campus and at a distance high-speed access to high bandwidth computing power and such applications as distance learning over university existing telephone wiring. And that leads me to the last area I want to talk about this afternoon, which is what does this mean for designers and users of tomorrow's networks? And once again, I'm going to say VUCA, velocity, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. This is what is shaping the environment that you're going to work into. So it's full of excitement. Couldn't be more exciting. As the internet grows, the definitions of quality and value will be increasingly de defined in terms of user service preferences and service level agreements. And that brings us to a major challenge. Designing systems and applications that are intuitive, user friendly, don't like the word, but it's often used, reliable, and above all, comfortable. That's my word, comfortable for the user. In the past, information technology hasn't always been successful in meeting that criteria. That's what they call an understatement, right? Hasn't always been successful. For instance, there are a lot of stories of the problems adults have in learning to use computers. And I'd like to give you just a few brief examples. You are allowed to laugh. Um, the first one is that a company's help desk reported that someone thought the mouse was a foot pedal and couldn't get it to work. A man confronted with a computer message, press any key to continue. We've all had that message. I'm sure anyone in this room not had that message. Right? Well, he couldn't find the any key on the keyboard, right? Okay. Uh, one person complained that the computer's cup holder wasn't working properly. Apparently the coffee cup holder wasn't working properly. And, and, and what was being referred to there was the CD-ROM caddy, right? Uh, when asked by a support line if she had windows, one woman replied, no, we've got air conditioning. And then finally, uh, and apparently, the, fir the first time one man, and this was reputedly an executive, okay, reputedly an executive, and I'm not pointing any fingers here or naming any names, right, used a mouse, he actually pointed it at the screen, right, as if it were a TV remote control. I mean, I know that is a male thing, right, the remote control, but he pointed the mouse at the screen and let a wire coming out of it, right? Because the moral here is that people largely want to be in on the technology wave, but lots of them 
are neophytes or restrained by fear or innate resistance. That is the fact, right? So young people have grown up with computer games and stuff like that. They don't have fear of keyboards, but I can assure you there are lots of people who worry themselves sick they're going to break something. And I usually do, right? But it doesn't worry me, right? So the difference is, I think, for a lot of people, it's, it seems to be something to do with impacting their esteem if this doesn't do what they want it to do. And so they get annoyed, and you've seen the video, I assume, on the internet of the guy throwing the PC out of the cubicle and then stamping on it. But um, I'm glad he didn't do it in Nortel because uh, we have enough of them broken already. To them, broadband is the physical consequence around one's midriff of drinking too much beer. Okay? Whether we're designing network architectures or a single software application, we all face the same similar design challenge. And that is ensuring that people can have continuous operation and ease and comfort in what they're trying to do. It's really important when you're thinking about your application, is this comfortable to use? You, as um, I say the intelligentsia in this, will make assumptions about ease of use, which unless you go to someone who knows nothing about it, will be entirely wrong. I can tell you that today, without any fear of contradiction, if you try it. Okay? You could contradict me right now, but if you go out and try it, you'll find that we often assume, because we are literate or understand something, that our language is understood by everybody. It is not. Right? Ideally, the system has to warn people of bad consequences before these occur. I was explaining to someone today that my wife was operating on a um, finance package and she, uh, it was a hot summer day in the UK, no air conditioning, very busy, heavy afternoon, and she fell asleep with her elbow on the Z button. Okay? And, and this actually wiped out the program in the computer, apart from filling the screen with Zs, which seemed to be prophetic. But in any words, it, it, you know, this should not happen. And I was explaining also to someone today that in the types of systems that we make, these are called Six Sigma systems, that's six um, standard deviation better quality than the average quality you get from production software. These are things like our, our switches, for example, have to run for 365 days a year, continuously. And we're allowed something like 12 to 13 seconds a year outage. Now you compare that with running Microsoft Windows or, um, let me say, Word or PowerPoint, I'll have to throw in Word Perfect as well, of course, because I'll get accused of being nasty to Microsoft, but I don't really mean it from that point of view. But programs that you switch off and on have a far better advantage than stuff that's got to run for 20 years, non-stop. And you have to apply different principles in designing them. And what I'm really alluding to here is when you move to what we can see in the internet and this pervasive use, the same defensive programming techniques and the same sort of um, uh, defense of the customer needs to be built into your design. It's not going to be switched off at night and switched on in the morning. It's going to be on all the time. And that makes a big difference. I lost my place now. Even the key objectives are changing. The following example is somewhat simplistic, but it does like highlight, highlight a major departure in customer orientation. For the so-called traditionalist, the question is usually, how can we help the customer? You get into shop, people will say to you, how can I help you? I sometimes run when people do that, by the way. If I go into, I know, it's, a, it's a famous men's store, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's uh, Moss or something like that. I can't, I can't remember the name of it, but there's one in Ottawa. When you go in the shop, people pounce on you. They say, how can you help me? I say, you can completely disappear, right? What's that effect? Because I don't like that. But anyways, people say, um, how can we help customers? But in the new paradigm we're looking at, it's how can we help customers help themselves? See, I'd like to go into that store and be able to look up some information to find what I need to find without anyone interfering with me so I can make up my mind without any pressure put on me. And that's a difference in selling. Right? It's a difference. See, when you make up your mind about something, you're almost immediately bought into it. And it's your decision and your loyalty to that product is different than if somebody came and sold it to you, in spite of the fact you really weren't keen, but to get shot at the guy, you buy it. Okay. So this is a different concept in psychological terms and all sorts of terms, but ownership of what you are doing is a real important issue. And your loyalty to what you've bought 
changes if you made the decision as opposed to you being sold that decision. Uh, <clears throat> in Nortel, we are actively involved at the moment in many initiatives to meet evolving needs of customers. One of the key concerns for users of the internet is security. Um, we have a Nortel spin-off in Trust, um, and they are delivering data security solutions to the financial services and other industries. So a lot of banks and a lot of companies, and we have partnerships with Microsoft, for example, they use some of this public key encryption capability that we've developed. And it's become an essential uh, component in the promise of electronic commerce into making it a mass market reality. So with IP spoofing and all sorts of things that go on, you don't want your credit card number being found by someone else and being used, and then you find out at the end of the month. Right? So there are such, such things as IPsec and such forthcoming, but you are going to have to have that sort of security. We're also participating in a consortium of more than 100 universities, government agencies, corporations and other institutions developing what has been named Internet 2. Um, the next generation Internet will handle multimedia applications 100 to 1,000 times faster than today's Internet, uh, allowing it to become the primary medium for businesses. And complementing Internet to, we are also part of an MIT Internet Telephony Consortium working on the technical, economic, strategic and policy issues uh, arising from the convergence of telephony and the Internet. This consortium is nurturing new forms of integrated multimedia uh, that use the full capability of Internet broadband networks. These networks will also demand new forms of access that overcome today's bottlenecks, uh, particularly the last mile of access to the network from businesses and homes. That access is now provided mainly by coaxial cable or by uh, copper wires designed for analog telephone transmission. So the last mile is a big hurdle, right? Um, cable modems and compression technology enable these networks to deliver fairly high speeds and wireless and satellite system have evolved to bridge that last mile cost effectively too. Um, I, one of the issues about the last mile is whether or not you have copper in place. But if you have to actually dig the streets up and put copper in, sometimes it's better to use wireless, right, than to, to do that. Because the you know, nine-tenths of the cost of putting that in is the digging in the civil works and the permission to do it. Handouts, right? Um, didn't say that. Take that off the video, right? Uh, the Nortel vision of WebTorn represents a powerful new tool in increasing the efficiency and speed of many different types of activities at work, education, delivery of social services, and personal entertainment and betterment, personal betterment. And that brings me to your part in this revolution. It's very difficult to know exactly what customers want in terms of web based services, web hosting, etc. <coughs> But the possibilities are virtually endless. Uh, for example, imagine what level of creativity could be unleashed in our universities, governments, or corporations if discussion groups could reach out easily and instantly to other groups, experts, or information data banks to get a second, third, fourth opinion on a particularly tough question. Imagine the value to a surgeon and the patient in a remote hospital in a rural location to be able to get the advice of a top surgeon in a teaching hospital hundreds or thousands of miles away, especially during a tricky operation. Imagine the power of students of any age studying virtually any subject and being able to electronically navigate into a discussion group or two or three anywhere in the world. They could reach out to experts on virtually any subject or delve into video and data banks to view not only historical accounts of a subject, but possibly even interpretive accounts as well from artists who may have viewed some subjects from even different angles. Imagine the creative powers that can be unleashed by a network that not only provides information and access, but lets the learning person create their own response and deliver it to virtually any other person elsewhere in the world. Dave Packard, the co-founder of Hewlett Packard, said that the development of new ideas is not limited by resources or technology, but by another completely different boundary. That is the limit of imagination. And that reminds me of a story I'd like to leave you with. Two men in a hot air balloon flew into a dense cloud. 
when they merged into sunlight, they were lost. Now, fortunately, one of them saw a man on the ground. He shouted to this man, where are we? The man replied, you're in a balloon. Ah, said the first balloonist to the second, you know, he's probably a consultant. Huh? Well, he said, how do you know that? He said, well, what he said was perfectly accurate, but it didn't actually help us. Right. Okay. <coughs> Meeting the challenges of designing what we've called unified networks entail meeting a host of challenges. We're just at the beginning of this undertaking with only imagination to tell us what the world will be like a few years from now. But we are taking the first steps towards creating exciting new possibilities for enriching society and bringing about a profound productive change in a global context. The key challenge for our industry is to ensure our technology solutions are not only accurate, but also useful and valuable to the people who use them. The new world of the emerging internet is an environment with the potential to deliver a new level of interactivity, creativity, and functionality, not just over distances between individuals, but on a scale of worldwide proportions. The ultimate value of this journey is that people will have more choices and more opportunities to interact with others and to exchange ideas on a grander scale. In spite of the chaos, I believe it's going to be about as exciting time as you've ever been through as we continue this historic move from dial tone into web tone. And I'll finish there and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. I see two sides of what you're saying, David. I guess I'd like a reaction. It seems to me that Nortel is doing a lot on the technology side. It's exciting to think that I'll be able to get information 17 times faster and billions of times more information than I've ever done before. Right. But from the perspective of the application, I kind of like to get relevant information, only relevant information, yes. all the relevant information yeah. in a reasonable amount of time. Put my glass on. Yeah. What kind of other projects might Nortel have to get to? Okay, so we have um, uh, a, a, an internet applications group. Um, I'm sure you've all had the, the browser overload situation where when you, um, you, you, you do a search for something and it comes back and says 2,800,000 uh, responses to that and you think, well, geez, I don't really know how to use this search engine and you search for even better ways of describing what you're trying to do to, and you maybe reduce it to 200,000 if you're lucky. Right? Now, there needs to be some technology that, that helps you to be more precise. So we think for, for a start off, search engines are really important in terms of, it actually cuts down traffic on the network, but it also helps you get to what you want to get to a bit better. So, for example, directory structures, directory of information, and classifi classification of information is a really important part of some of the work that we're trying to do. Um, the user applications really have to do some of that work for you. I mean, if something comes back with two million uh, replies. I mean, an application can say, uh, you know, it's not, not good enough. Now, so one of the things that we've been developing in a, in a parallel context is, is um, a sort of natural language inquiry system. And um, it has actually been used, uh, funnily enough, on our speech work type activity where you can talk to a hotel and a hotel's computer talks to you. So you can actually talk to this and make a hotel reservation in, as you would in natural language, uh, except that the hotel, the, the system in the hotel actually breaks us down into certain things that are important to it, like dates, times, and rooms. And so then speaks back to you and confirms to you, you know, this is what we, th we thought you asked for, is it what you wanted? And you can have an argument with it. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things we're experimenting with, and it is actually quite interesting to, to do that, because one of the big frustrations is, I mean, I, I, I must spend hours on the net trying to find information. I, I wanted to book my wife or find my wife a hotel in, uh, in Niagara, Niagara Falls. She's there yesterday, today, and tomorrow with a friend of hers from Scotland. And I misspelled Niagara. Right? I didn't put the A at the end, right? But Viagra, right? And I didn't put this in. And uh, I was completely lost and completely bamboozled because I kept getting information that seemed relevant but was totally irrelevant. 
So I searched, right? And, and yeah. So I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of aspects in terms of the user interfaces that are, are, are important. Some other aspects that we talked about just over lunchtime are um, we, uh, part of the talk here. I said about the inversion of the network. Um, you as users want to do what you want to do, not what the network constrains you to do. The networks of today are built. Um, around certain structures which were important to preserve the integrity of the current voice network. So for example, 64 kilobits is used as a sort of standard framing technique for voice. You take in a, a stream from an analog phone, it gets converted into, well it gets compressed first of all to a bandwidth of 3.4 kilohertz, it then gets sampled at a certain rate that uh, produces a 64 kilobit stream. And those get formed up into little cell, little frames, if you like. You could call them cells because they're absolutely the same length all the time, but 125 microseconds wide, and they go zipping across the network. There are two standards for doing that. But effectively, if you try to do anything else, you can't, because it has to conform to that 64 kilobit standard, right? And that's always been a dilemma, and that's why you get overlay networks. That's why X25 networks arrived. That's why private networks arrived where you could use your own protocols. Um, IP, actually, um, one of the originators of the IP, um, I was talking to him, uh, was saying that at one point the, the, the reason, one of the rationales for, in, for developing an internet protocol, an internetworking protocol, was the fact that so many different systems involved that they wanted something that could, could run over anything. So what I find is a real inversion is that at that point IP was a protocol that could run over anything. And today we're talking about running anything over IP. Right? So that, that's a yet another inversion that's occurring. So I guess um, heart of my thinking is if you're looking at how to design a network, then what is actually at the end user has to be able to negotiate with the network about what you need. I want to know, um, for example, I want to know who I need to connect to or what I need to make a connection to. And I use the word connection loosely because connection here I'm using in the context of the ordinary person in the street. And many of us know that this is totally connectionless. Different route can be taken every time um, some information packet flows, right? But in reality, if you want to connect to one or many people, you can set that up. You also know what kind of bandwidth you want to communicate for ideal or optimum use of this device. You also probably know whether or not you can tolerate any delay in what you're trying to do as a result of the application you're trying to run. And you probably know what you're prepared to pay. So if you can imagine some kind of fuzzy logic in some interface that you've given those parameters to, it can then negotiate with different network providers as brokers who can bring to you something that meets your parameters. And so your application can be given the permission to accept a connection on your behalf. So you don't have to be bothered with all that stuff, right? So you write applications that will enable that front ending to occur, right? And, and so uh, that's one interesting aspect. There are other things that we talked about, you know, limitless bandwidth. Well, believe me, it will never be limitless. It will never, ever be more than you can use. It's a bit like chocolate, right? It will never be more than you can use. So congestion will occur, always. So today, modern congestion mechanisms and networks typically rely on feedback from the network to turn off traffic, to bump low priority traffic or whatever. And some of those have become more complex than the actual basic devices or the switching components themselves. In ATM, for example, and please show if I'm getting into too much detail, but in ATM, ABR, um, that's available bitrate, is a best effort type service, but it has associated with it very uh, complex feedback systems to let the end station know whether they can or not transmit. The actual things you have to develop, and because that has to be on a per user basis, right, starts to increase the cost of those entities phenomenally. So yet another idea which is going to start to take some, um, I, I guess, credence in, as we move forward is, is the use of pricing to stop congestion. So if the network's busy, it'd be like booking a, line, a seat on an airliner. If the tra you know, goes to the highest bidder. So your application might decide, I'm not going to take it right now. Can't get it at the price you want. Or it might say to you, I can only get it at this price. Do you still want to do it now? 
So there'll be other ways of controlling things like congestion where typically we build electronics and software and so on into the network. It might actually be what you have to pay that controls the congestion. And of course, if we're all billionaires, then we've got another problem to face. But, but right now, you could use different paradigms. But you need a closed loop feedback system. One might be what you have to pay. It's, it's exciting, very exciting. It's, it sounds like you're telling me that I live about three blocks from this big lake, and right now I have to get water with a teaspoon. Yeah. And so it's this last mile problem. Yeah. When is that going to be solved, and, and what's Nortel doing about that? Well, I, I think I've said to you, we, we already have solutions in the last mile space. So we, we are currently shipping <coughs> one meg modem, and uh, it certainly makes a big difference. Um, my, uh, so, so the last mile, I think, will evolve very dramatically over the next few years. There are some higher speed technologies, and of course the cable modems run at even higher rates than that. Um, but I don't know if you've ever watched the construction of a major highway and to ease congestion in a city or a town. And as you move and build the highway, the congestion moves to a different place. And once you've completed it, you now have a new form of congestion because it gets filled, and so you have to start doing something again. So whilst I think the last mile is important, once you've solved that problem, what's behind it within the network, and I mean there some of the server technology and uh, you know the bandwidth in the network to shift the information around, starts to become the issue. There's some interesting correlation you might like to try. Um, if you look at the uh, market forecast for bandwidth on high capacity trunk links and networks, and that's readily available data, so I'm not gonna give you a hint here uh, what it is, but if you look at it for the year 2005, and you look at the um, predicted growth in access technologies, this would be um, high speed ethernet to the home, gigabit, 10 gigabit ethernet to the home, and things like that. If you multiply all the access and compare it, do a correlation with the amount of bandwidth on the backbone that would be needed to support it. Um, it's a good exercise to do. I'm not going to tell you the answer, but it's a good exercise to look at what happens in a set of shifting dimensions. So you're, you're, um, if we solve the access problem, I think is what I'm saying, is you're going to find some other things that we have to resolve. Um, and I happen to think that um, a critical thing which is not getting a lot of time at the moment is, is what the server technologies are that we're using and the network that allows them to exist and all be accurate and up to date. So if you take directory enabled network services, for example, something where a directory can determine what kind of agreement you have, what kind of qualities of service you get, and what kind of policies are to be enacted on your behalf by the routers on the network, then that's okay when you're doing two or three transactions at a time, but you know, once you step that up into thousands concurrently, and then maybe n thousands concurrently, then the server and the processing technology associated with that, and the software you write, to allow that to happen, and the structure of the directories start to become absolutely crucial in delay performance of the network. It's not any longer the optical fibers or the terabit routers or those things, it's the amount of processing you have to do to, to create that security. So you bring up a good point, it, is, is it seems like there's a very quick shift where the software becomes the bottleneck, and I'm wondering if Absolutely. Nortel doing anything oh, yeah. in that area, what can you talk I, about? I, I, I believe all of the major companies are doing work in this area. It's, it's uh, an area we're all uh, intensely interested in. Um, uh, <coughs> I guess we've identified that what we call industrial grade servers are essential, are vitally important things. Um, again, I don't want to get into a lot of details, but we have been talking to various companies who make very high performance computing machines and to look at how they construct those. Now, the issue here is what, is what sits behind them to maintain them. Because uh, I guess if you, if you look in a, I don't know if how many of you are familiar with the voice network structure, but the voice network structure is, is done that it has a big data network behind it. So when you dial a number and the phone rings somewhere in the world, well, you think it's ringing instantly. So you just finish dialing, you get ringing to one if the person's there. Well, what's actually happened is you've got this huge uh, computer network behind your number seven signaling network, which is determining whether the other person is apparently there from what you can tell, right, from, from the line, and that a connection can be made, right? Now, that network itself is huge and requires a lot of uh, specialized techniques to make it operate. Without that network, you would literally wait minutes before anything occurred after you'd finished dialing. Right? The scale of the network is today. And that's the change that we're about to move into 
on what we do with internet, right? And so I guess what I'm set, what I what I believe to be the case is that's the step we have to take. I was reminded I was in York in the United Kingdom two weeks ago, and. Uh, attending my son's graduation and the hotel I was at was, was talking about people stealing um, information coming to them. So their requests for accommodation were being intercepted. And it reminded me somewhat of um, how the Strouger switch was first created. I don't know if you know what the Strouger switch is, but it was an old electromechanical thing that moved up and down. It was wonderful to watch. and. Um, but it was created for the following reason. Strouger was a Kansas undertaker. And all of the telephony was done through manual switchboards. But the operator, when he, as an undertaker, was being selected by a customer, was diverting the calls to a competing undertaker. <laughs> right? This is where innovation comes from. Right? So he invented what was called the Strouger switch. He went out with no knowledge of anything to do with electromagnetism and created an automatic switch so he could be sure that calls would come to him that were for him. Right? Now, so I look at the IP network, the internet today, and here's this man asking me the same question that was asked of Strouger more than a century ago. Right? And I say, whoa, there's a lot that we have to do. Right? There's a lot that we have to do. Right? And I think that is really the important thing. We're really at the beginning of this. Remember, today's internet really started off as a, a, I guess, a National Science Foundation project funded by government to interconnect in, uh, um, education, government institutions, and so on. And its use has suddenly catapulted into almost everyone's domain by, generally, I think, because of the, um, the, the browser technology that's been developed. Because before that, I can tell you, I tried to use it. It was like the first time I tried to use Unix, right? Just about drove me nuts, right? To so think, what are all these words for, right? And roots and goodness knows what. And internet was the same. It used to be phenomenally difficult. All these funny addresses to remember and all that sort of stuff. And then suddenly someone put something in front of it and made it easier to use. And then commercial things started to appear. And suddenly you've got a complete new paradigm in front of you. I mean, it's such a change, such a change. It's, to me, tremendously exciting, right? And um, it's, 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 it's turning everything on its head. Uh, so I fundamentally think, I, I think that um, with respect to your question, the last mile is one issue, but there are a lot of things to do with um, <coughs> management, policy management, service level agreements. I mean, broadcast, um, things like IP multicast are, uh, key issues as, as we go forward. I mean, a lot of people want to broadcast information to a lot of people at the same time. Um, uh, in Europe, for example, I don't, know, I don't know if I've ever seen a betting shop here, but in many of the European countries, there are betting shops where you can go in and bet on horses running races, right? Well, no one wants to get the information about the odds on a horse race out of time, okay? So, so they all have private networks, and they have what's called order wires to deliver that information so they know exactly what the starting prices are, because that's what we're going to pay out on, right? Now, IP multicast is seen as something that could do that, but could you honestly say today you could guarantee the delivery would be simultaneous to every betting shop, right? So there's yet another set of issues, right? So I think we're surrounded by huge, huge opportunities to, and things to crack. Hmm? The, 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 yeah, the, the, the glass that can go faster than light so you can see in the future. Does yeah. WebTalk include this concept of multilingual capabilities so the, for the people who do not speak English in right. the world yeah. are able to communicate and use internet? Yeah. Well, I think, um, I think I said to you that the growth of uh, other language, um, internet web hosting sites is, is starting to, to it, it's growing very fast now. Um, and uh, I, I, it's, I believe, almost essential. Uh, the more interesting question is, how do you move between one and the other, right, and be able to understand both? And then it starts another philosophical debate about, is language as we currently uh, use it going to be adequate in the next hundred years? Okay. Um, is text as we use it going to be adequate in the next hundred years? Right? Are the things we use today as interfaces we hit icons. 
our iconic language is going to come back in a different form. And so a whole bunch of interesting, intriguing thoughts, right? But I think that um, web hosting is the thing that drives bandwidth, and most people who are in the... Um, uh, if there, there are certain types of um, customers of Nortel who provide um, bandwidth for internet service providers. And one of the key business models that's used is to provide web hosting capabilities and web hosting applications. Because the more web hosting you do, the more bandwidth you drive. The more bandwidth that's driven, the more revenue they make. Okay? So that's the business model. So they have a huge incentive to get multiple language web hosts built because in countries like Canada, for example, there are many nationalities and many languages available in the cultural mix you have here. So to have web hosting of different languages um, is a huge potential for driving bandwidth for those people who supply the bandwidth itself. Right? So I, I see that as something which will come very quickly. Yeah? I'd love to see the web that can translate from one language to another without having something to get involved, but uh, there is a Tower of Babel somewhere, right? But yeah. so far, I mean, web search doesn't even support many languages. That's what I'm saying. I agree with you. I think those are changes that have to come, right? I mean, if you want Cantonese or Mandarin or anything like that, you really would struggle right now. I can't even find a keyboard that does it, let alone <laughs> it's right, right? That's why I ask, is language as we currently know it adequate? Right? <coughs> Well, you are a knowledgeable person. I'm glad that oh, thank you, you. Right. to be here to talk to us. As a matter of fact, my major critique of Waterloo is when, when it comes to speakers, we do not get as uh, high caliber of speakers as say, the MIT, and I'm glad that you said now an indication of a trend, hopefully, mm. in here. Now, the question I have to you is as follows, yeah? If uh, a knowledgeable person was looking at the beginning of uh, microprocessors, the beginning grams in the 1970s, a knowledgeable person could say that there's something significant that's brewing in here that's going to have uh, yeah. significant consequences. Right. If you looked at the internet in the late 80s, early 90s, you could see the same thing. Right. So is there something else that you see from your perspective that's brewing out there that can have potentially so, consequences? Yeah. I, I have things that excite the hell out of me. Yeah. And I remember, um, so I'm going to get around to answer the question, but I, I'm just going to give you a couple examples of people yeah. who've had this feeling. Um, David Howes, who, is, who was the CEO of Bay Networks, I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago, and he uh, discovered the Intel 4004 computer around about 1972 or something like that. And went home and said to his wife, I've just come across something that's going to change my life and change the world. Yeah. Right? And it's also going to change your life because we're going to the West Coast uh, <laughs> because I've just accepted a job with Intel. Right? Yeah. Okay. So that excitement comes across, um, I think, um, a few times. And I became aware of the internet, I guess. Uh, we used it in our labs in the UK um, mm -hmm. a while ago. For me, the thing that's really exciting me just now is um, I, I, I think internet as we have it today as a best effort service is, is a fairly early version of something that I think is going to become the predominant communication system of the future. So for me, that, that is that um, thing that excites me. Right? That is that change. Because as it stands today, with the routers as they're defined today, and so on, it's not sustainable for the things that we're trying to use it for. So it's very easy to say what needs to change. But the things that need to change are far from trivial. And I have a list of them, and the list gets longer all the time. But what happens when you develop the list is you develop more knowledge about the challenge that sits in front of you. And you develop then confidence about what steps you need to take and what order you need to take them in. And I, I'm excited by the fact that, you know, Nortel and Bay have come together because the one thing that I guess you know of bellheads and netheads, and I think Nortel yesterday was called a bethead, right? Because I don't think the analysts are too sure about this, but the um, the the bellhead mentality is um, very much around structured networks and very structured entities and so on, and keeping control in the network, right? 
-hmm. The net head mentality is to say, no, let the end user equipment control what needs to happen. So my equivalent to the 4004, right, is that intelligence in the network will transform. It will go through a metamorphosis in that that, that resides in the network will be there to help you do what you want to do. In fact, it will be not a gatekeeper, but a gateway for you to enable you to do what you want to do. And the end user applications will give you more choice than you've ever dreamed you could have about where you can go and what you can do with what you have. So to me, that's a dream. I don't want the network to impede me in any sense or form. And I don't want to have to log on with all these silly log on things and things like that. Those are all going to change, right? Um, I believe, um, for example, that if we don't come to this challenge, there are other players who will. If you look at companies like um, Intel and Microsoft and Dell, if we don't solve some of these challenges, their growth as companies is going to be impeded. So there, there may be other new players step into the arena that say, Guy, if you guys don't do this, we're going to do this a different way. And, and that's the economy. Now, the other part of it is mobility associated with this. Because today when I wander around with my laptop, and I don't do it very often because my arms are getting longer, right, is the fact that when I go somewhere else, I have to start thinking about IP domains and IP addresses and changes I have to make, and then I forget to restore them, and then I can't figure out for two days why something won't work, and I have to go through the whole damn process of resetting preferences and all that sort of stuff, right? I don't need that. I do not need that. Right? That has to change, right? And so that's yet another thing in terms of usability of the network. I want to go to a hotel, plug in, and I'm on to whatever I need. Yeah. I don't have to do anything else, right? When I go to a hotel with a phone in it, I lift it up and I dial. Full stop, nothing else, I don't need to do it, right? So to me, these are the key things that have to change that let us be as productive as we can be. Now, what are the challenges for us as humans? Because there are challenges for each of us, right? Um, <clears throat> I said in there that there are 250 million internet users and they send me an email every day. And one of my challenges is how to cope with all the information. How to cope with it. Yeah, between what arrives in my entry, what arrives on voicemails, what arrives on emails, what arrives on fax machines, it is more, it's like reading the Encyclopedia Britannica every three weeks. Right? And you know that isn't possible, I know that's not possible. So I see filters, tools, etc., which allow me to just look at what I need to look at by me setting preferences. So as user applications, things that, I mean, already I tell people, if you copy to me, CC me, it's unlikely to be read. Don't say you sent it to me and expect me to read it. Don't rely on that mechanism. Because the, just the overload of information is unbearable. You just look at a, a, an airline ticket at the moment. It's unbearable. Do you know how much it costs to add an extra box to an airline ticket to make it easier for you to use? You know, you'd be surprised. It's in the dollars, right? It's in the dollars. See, I'd like on my airline ticket for the airline ticket to say that that airline I'm flying with has got at least a certain level of safety, mm -hmm. right? And it costs so much to put that on each ticket, they don't do it. And, but I'd really like to know that as a user. That's just a sidetrack, but that's the sort of thing I feel I'm entitled to know, right? So I see all of that being able to change, right? I mean, I already use electronic tickets. But when you turn up at an airport with an electronic ticket, this is an experience you have to have yet, right? Because most people say, oh, I've never seen one of these before. Isn't this exciting? The trouble is you, you spend about 10 times the amount of time of your personal time using an electronic ticket at the airport than if you have this big wad of paper, right? So I think going beyond your question, going beyond your question, another area which I'm keenly interested in is the effect of all of ours on the ecology okay? and what we're doing to the ecology. And uh, we as a company are very concerned about that and 
I am leading some initiatives relative to um, elimination of hazardous material, the recycling of materials, and so on and so forth. I think a communication infrastructure is the best chance you have at solving many of the ecological problems, if we only could settle down to look at it. Right? So from my perspective, that's yet another area where um, you know, we, we use up so much hydrocarbons, carbon fuels, toxic substances. I mean, if I wear black, I think I'm wearing almost black, this is the most toxically produced material, is anything in black. What is the fashion this year? If you look around, I, was a, I do a bit of ballroom dancing, I looked around the other two weeks ago at a dance festival in Montreal. Almost everyone was wearing black. And I've just read the document the week before. The material to color black uses the chemicals which are most destructive. Now, I don't know the one that's most friendly, but I know that black's not right. <laughs> so, so, you know, you, you, to me, um, we need to become more aware of those kind of aspects too. And I think communication network is a very good way of overcoming some of those things. I don't think, however, that you can end up with everybody working at home and no one going outside their house because we are social beings after all, and we need to communicate and talk to each other and have lives other than sitting staring at a computer screen. I'm worried about that too. But uh, I do think there are methods. You know, most of what you do in a factory, you could do from your home, right? Having inventory delivered and moved down a production line. Uh, it could be done from home. So I, I, those, are the, those are the big steps I see coming up, right? But I really worry about third world debt. I worry about um, social impact of these things on people. I worry about a lot of the world. I, I, some statistics I was giving to people today was the percentage of people who've never made a phone call in their lives. It's about half the planet. Right? I mean, you're a quarter of the planet's baby, so that's okay. We have time for one more question. One more question. Um, C programming language revolutionized the use of computers and the functionality of computers because it made hardware accessible to a fast development process. Yeah. And then you now Java in some ways a progression from C, but in other ways it's a regression. Uh, is, do you think Java can really be the language of the internet, the language of the future for development? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Java, um, when I first heard of Java and all the applets and all this stuff, I worried myself to death. I could all only think of all these bloody viruses have been flent, sent from one place to another and been replicated a gazillion times. And uh, the, the, the sort of notion of Java is not a new notion either. Either it's been something that interpretive, interpretative languages have been around for quite a while in various forms. Um, I, I, I'd make the distinction um, like this on software. Generally speaking, I don't focus on just from a perspective of development. I don't focus just on the language, but I focus on what kind of system sits behind it to allow me to be able to test and verify what I'm doing. I'm looking for reducing complexity. I certainly like high-level languages. I mean, I'm not against them. But there are some, like Lisp that I've used, that are very tough to prove whether what you've done is, is, not gonna, is gonna be able to stand you know, the test of abuse that the customer puts them through. I worry about things like, in languages, like um, hashing algorithms and garbage collection because of the amount of resources they take up. So when I, when I look at a language and look at what I'm using to build systems, I have to look at the total context of what I'm producing at the end and whether or not I can afford some of the overhead that's implied with them. Going back to Java, um, we have used Java and Java applets on some of our, our sets, right? So some of the, uh, the mobile phones use Java. And uh, the interesting test of Java, I had uh, a visit from Sun Microsystems, uh, it was last, uh, end of last year, and I was, I was told that when you put the, you know, you have your, eff effectively an interpretive engine in, in your device, and you have a Java app that arrives and it's executed, and psh, fantastic things occur. I was told that it was 100% secure, right? And uh, I, I uh, as, uh, this is a bit of tomfoolery, by the way, so I, I just pulled a bit of paper and I said, I, I, I'm about to sign a contract with you for Java. It says on here, 100% secure, will not destroy my user's application, please sign it. Well, 
some executives decided they wouldn't be prepared to sign this, right? So it's not, yeah, it, it's one thing saying that, it's another thing. I think that um, you have to be very, very sensitive to things that could disrupt the user's use of their network. Because you can get awfully annoyed at you know, something breaking what you've got, right? And even if it's possible to load it again, if it's eliminated all your directories or all your phone numbers or all your whatever, right? You, you know, the fact you can recover from it is one thing. But if a virus comes in and completely pervades your system and you say, okay, I can back it up. But it's using up a lot of your time, right? So I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not skeptical about it. I'm sure the technology can be evolved. And I've even suggested that they put into it some public key encryption and stuff like that to make sure that the, the two users can authenticate that, that this applet will actually something they want. I mean, do you really want these things, right? So you know that um, Netscape and various other browsers use Java plugins anyway, right, in, in, the, in the system. So I think it's, it's just one part of a panoply of things you need. But what I'm looking for is um, things that provide high performance. If we're looking at industrial grade servers for handling, you know, if you're doing multiple voice connections and people say, I want a secure voice connection, I don't want you listening to my voice connection. No one can listen into it today other than the police, right? It is possible to go on top of the line, but it's strictly illegal. But I can find your IP address, I can listen into your conversations, presuming I've got the same decoding algorithm, right? People really don't want that to happen. So if you imagine that a lot of people said, oh, I want a secure voice, then you're going to have to encrypt every voice connection. If you're going to encrypt every voice connection, you have instantaneous keys, that means server lookups, and that means there's a lot going to be happening. Because there's still more voice calls than there are data transactions by a huge factor. So when you start to examine that, I mean today at a trunk switch level, we're looking at something like 4 million call attempts in an hour on a single switch. Can you imagine a server and a router having to cope with that? Right? And that's just, that's just to do the processing of the call. That's not to maintain the connection, do the billing and all the other things that come with it. Right? So I'm looking for a panoply of um, software techniques. I think Java has a space in the user interface domain, but real-time operating systems are really important. Performance is really important. Concurrency is hugely important. Separation of concerns is hugely important. important. And development methodologies that allow you to test and not introduce huge complexity. Because what we do know for sure is the more complex an entity becomes, the more error prone it becomes. And it's a simple correlation. And so what we do is we test the stuff and we measure it. And if we see something that goes over complexity, it gets rewritten. Simple as that. You can't make that high quality software with high degrees of error proneness in the system. You can never debug them, you can never fix them. You just, each one introduces four or five more problems, right? As you fix them. So my advice to you if you're writing software is to keep it simple. Keep it simple, analyze the information, analyze the requirement to the point that you can understand and get your arm around it, and then keep it simple. Because I've seen more systems fail because someone thought it would be nice to add a bit, right? <laughs> Including myself, of course, right? I hope I've tried to answer your question. Well, I'd like to thank David very much for an interesting and uh, uh, rather thought-provoking talk. It's been my pleasure to have him here, and I'd like to show our appreciation. Thank you very much. <laughs>